have a confession to make. For many years, despite knowing the health risks associated with this behavior, I used to lie out in the sun hoping to achieve a fabulous looking tan. <laughs> and I did this with full knowledge and understanding that exposure to UV radiation can increase the risk of skin cancer. Interestingly, I learned about the health risks of tanning through the public school system. I remember in elementary school, gathering in a school gymnasium for a presentation on the risks of sun exposure. The presenter used a catchy tagline called slip, slop, slap, which you may remember if you were a kid in the 80s. The tagline went, slip on a shirt, slop on some sunscreen, slap on a hat. And it worked so well, I still remember it several decades later. Nonetheless, as an adult, I still chose to forego the shirt, hat, and sunscreen in the hopes of improving my tan. Clearly, I was valuing something else above my own health. Trying to look good is just one example of something people may value above their own health. As public health professionals, we may expect people to prioritize health above everything else. But we all value numerous things that compete with health. Understanding these competing values and how they interact with health can help us understand why some people may oppose health promoting policies. Understanding this can help us build better policies, programs, and improve health behaviors. There may also be situations where the level of public health intervention ought to be limited. Sometimes you hear about policies being called paternalistic. Paternalism is the interference with another person against their will, motivated by the claim that they will be better off. When you hear people talk about the nanny state, they are usually referring to policies they perceive to be paternalistic. Understanding values that compete with health can help us understand opposition to certain public health policies. Before I continue talking about values that compete with health, I first want to point out what this talk is not about. This talk is about decisions that harm one's own health only, not decisions that harm other people, such as refusing to vaccinate your children. This talk is about situations where all options are available to an individual. So it's not about bar barriers to public health. And this talk is also about competent, autonomous adults who have full access to the information necessary to make a fully informed decision. So it's not about children or people with serious addictions whose decisions may not be fully voluntary. With that in mind, let's look at some other examples, other than trying to look good, that may <laughs> compete with public health. One example is time. People tend to be busy and therefore place a lot of value on time. It's faster and easier to buy a prepared meal than to cook a meal at home. But home cooked meals tend to be healthier because you have more control over the ingredients. Another example is productivity at work. Many people prioritize productivity, despite the evidence that prolonged stress and insufficient sleep is bad for your health. The examples I just gave are of individual level behaviors based on values that may compete with health. As public health professionals, we often work to change policies to improve health an example that competes with health at the policy level is money. You often hear about policies, whether they're focused on health or something else, as being a waste of taxpayers' money. Another example is personal freedom. Remember earlier I defined paternalism as the interference with another person against their will so that they'll be better off. Policies thought to be paternalistic are thought to, be, are thought to reduce personal freedom. People opposed to these policies may see them as intrusions into their right to make decisions for themselves. Some people may feel like they are being treated like children. Some may see these policies as the imposition of elitist ideals that they themselves do not share. They may not prioritize health above all else and see these policies as sacrificing quality of life in order to extend life. The Newfield Council on Bioethics came up with something called an intervention ladder that can be used to rank policies by how much they interfere with personal freedom. And this is a useful tool for looking at, at potential opposition to healthy policies based on a competing value of personal freedom. 
So as you move up the ladder, policies tend to restrict personal freedom to a greater degree. But at the same time, as you move up the ladder, policies also tend to be better at reducing health risk. Let's look at examples of policies that target the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, such as pop. Excessive sugary drink consumption is linked with poorer health due to an increased risk of chronic diseases such as diabetes. Consumption is high in many countries, such as the US and several Latin American countries. Therefore, sugar, sugary drinks are a common target of public health policy. At the bottom of the ladder, the option that restricts personal freedom the least is to do nothing or monitor the situation. Many organizations do monitor sugary drink consumption using sales data. The next least interfering option is to inform people about their sugary drink consumption and the health risks associated. In Canada, all packaged foods and drinks are required to have a nutrition label that includes the number of grams of sugar and the percentage of the daily recommended intake. Next on the ladder is enabling choice. I remember when I was a kid, most vending machines that sold drinks only sold sugary drinks. There was a reason we called them pop machines. Now, most vending machines also sell bottled water, which enables people to make a healthier choice than pop. N the next step on the ladder is changing the default option. California just passed a law requiring milk or water to be the default drink sold with kids' meals. People can still choose pop, but beginning in 2019, it will no longer be the default option. Guiding through incentives is the next step on the ladder. Some jurisdictions, such as England, require licensed establishments to provide tap water free of charge. This can be an incentive to drink water instead of paying for a more expensive but less healthy beverage. Guiding through disincentives interferes with personal freedom to a greater degree. An example of this would be a tax on sugary drinks. Mexico and Chile have both implemented taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages. The next step is to restrict choice. New York City attempted a ban on sugary drinks over half a liter in size, but this was ultimately struck down by the court system in New York which said that it went beyond the limits of the city's authority. And the option at the top of the ladder, thought to reduce personal freedom the most, is to completely eliminate choice. This would involve a total ban on the sale of sugary drinks across a jurisdiction. And to my knowledge, no jurisdiction has done this. People's level of discomfort or opposition to, to public health policies tends to go up as you move up the ladder. As you can imagine, few people are opposed to offering, to enabling choice by offering bottled water in vending machines. But many people were unhappy with New York's attempt to restrict the size of sugary drinks, which is why that proposition was ultimately struck down. Of course, every situation is different, and people's level of discomfort as you move up the ladder depends on who and what the policies are targeting. Remember earlier I said this, this talk is about competent adults who can make fully voluntary decisions. People tend to be more comfortable influencing the health choices of children who have not yet reached a level of maturity where they can make fully voluntary decisions. So many schools have banned the sale of sugary drinks from, their, from the cafeterias with little opposition. The level of acceptance with more restrictive policies also depends on what is being targeted. Canada recently implemented a total ban on artificial trans fats from the food supply. And this met little opposition because such a ban will have little impact on most people's lives. In addition to helping us, under, helping us understand opposition to public health policies, looking at competing values in this way can also help us identify policies that ought to be limited. There are many foods and drinks that are bad for your health. Most people are okay with informing people about health risks and enabling choice. But is a total ban on chips and chocolate bars acceptable? The link between insufficient physical activity and chronic disease is well established. But should people be required to do a minimum amount of physical activity every day? Many people choose to work long hours 
and don't get the recommended amount of sleep? Should we mandate a minimum amount of leisure and sleep time? Most people would find such extreme interventions unacceptable. Let's look at some real world policies that are thought to be policy oversteps by many people. Kinder Egg Surprise is banned across the United States because the FDA does not allow candies to contain non-nutritive objects. In Aspen, Colorado, it is illegal to have a snowball fight. <laughs> in Bloomfield, Connecticut, eating in your car is prohibited. In Florida, internet cafes were banned in an attempt to crack down on illegal gambling. And in Hawaii and New Jersey, it is illegal to walk and text at the same time. While these policies are unlikely to affect anyone's quality of life in a serious way, a lot of people see them as policy oversteps and may even find them a bit ridiculous. It's our job, as members of the public health workforce, to promote health by preventing illness and injury. A common way this is done is through public policy. Understanding values that compete with health is the key to understanding opposition to public health policy. It will also help us identify policies that really do go too far. All of this can help us tailor policies to make them more acceptable and therefore more effective. As far as my tanning habit goes, these days I have given up on my goal to obtain the perfect tan. I now bring an umbrella to the beach. I always wear sunscreen if I'm out in the sun for more than 20 minutes. Sometimes I lie out in the sun for a short period of time because it's relaxing, but never when the sun is at its strongest and always with sunscreen. So it appears the slip slop slap public health campaign has finally worked. But would I be opposed to a total ban on lying in the sun? Absolutely. Thank <laughs> you.